Highlands History Project. <coughs> My name is Lillian Gantsudis. I am on staff at the Atlantic History Center. We're at the Atlantic History Center. Today is September the 3rd, 2003. And today I'm interviewing Harry Tracy Macklin. Mm -hmm. Mr. Macklin, would you give us your name, spell your last name? I go by H.T. Macklin, M-A-C-L-I-N. And would you give me your date and place of birth? I was born November 27th, 1925 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, would you take a few minutes and tell us something about growing up in Oklahoma City? Well, actually, I didn't grow up in Oklahoma City. I'm told that we lived there just two weeks until my family moved back to Texas, Fort Worth, where they came from. And I was an only child. Um, my dad worked for Swift and Company in I Fort Worth. Tell your father's name. His name was I was named for him, so I'm a junior. His name was Harry Tracy, also, but he went by the by the name of Tracy. Uh, a cousin, just a year older, took the Harry part, and I was left with H. T., which is a very common Southern custom. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I grew up in uh, North Fort Worth. Uh, my mother uh, worked at one of the big hotels in the city as a hostess. And tell uh, me your mother's name. Her name is Winnie. Mm -hmm. Her she came originally. She was born in Oklahoma. Uh, both my mother and dad came from very large families, nine and eleven children each, and uh, they were very uh, lived in rural areas. Uh, the families were relatively poor, and so none of them really got much of an education. Neither of them got beyond the eighth grade, and uh, so they they lived a rather hard life. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't recall growing up in those circumstances uh, as one of deprivation of any sort. I usually had what I needed, it seemed, at least I thought I did, and that's what's really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we lived, in, we lived in Fort Worth. Fort Worth for grammar school and into high school? Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me something about high school in Fort Worth. High school, uh, I went to a small high school. In fact, I, the elementary school that I went to there was the same school, in fact, the same building that my dad went to elementary school called Diamond Hill. Um, it was in North Fort Worth, uh, sort of the, the brow of a hill. How it got the name Diamond, I don't know. But uh, high school was, was small. In my graduating class, there were, I think, 28 students. What year was it? This was, uh, I graduated in uh, 1942. Mm -hmm. I was 15 at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the war had started. I shall never forget uh, that Sunday early afternoon we had I had gotten home Pearl from Pearl Harbor from uh, neither my mother or dad uh, uh, went to a church of any kind but my dad's mother my grandmother was a very devout Christian woman and uh, she took me with her and we had just gotten home from church uh, church that day and I was reading the comics when uh, the announcement my dad always listened to the news and when uh, we heard Roosevelt's voice come over the radio about 1.30 in the afternoon informing us of what had happened at Pearl Harbor. What was the family's reaction? How did you feel? You, well, you I was 15. I was, uh, uh, I was four, you know, I had just turned 15. And um, we had a couple of neighbors down, we had a neighbor just down the street, two, do two doors down from us called the Boydstons. I knew they had, they had four sons, two of whom were in the Navy, and I thought they were in the Pacific but had no idea where. But the following week, uh, the tragic news came that both boys had been on the Arizona and both were killed at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So that was the first, we were sort of a tight-knit community there and it, it, it struck the whole community a, a very uh, severe blow. Uh, because they were amongst the first casualties of that war. And uh, I've since visited the Pearl Harbor Memorial and seen their names on that marvelous plaque. How old were those boys? Uh, one was 17 and one was 19. Was it their only children? No, they had two other boys. Were the two other boys older or younger? They were older. Older? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you graduated? Graduated from high school. The war had started. Um, Early 15. I was 15. Uh, no, it wasn't draft age yet. I skipped a grade uh, somewhere in there, 
and uh, my the, the the pastor of the church, First Methodist Church in Fort Worth, had been elected the president of Southwestern University the year I graduated from high school. His son was my age. He'd graduated from high school and and he would hear of nothing except that I go also to Southwestern University at Georgetown, Texas. And so I went off to Georgetown at 15. And um, the first year, I think I majored in catching snakes and skinning their hides. And it reflected in my grades. <laughs> but then I woke up and then, you know, got, sort of got busy at my studies. And, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, by the time 44 came around, I was uh, turning 18. And, of course, we had to sign up for the draft. By that time, all of the boys on our campus uh, were Navy V-12, and except for four of us, civilian boys left. And so we did all of our phys ed and marching and everything with the Navy V-12 unit, and uh, except that we wore civilian clothes. And uh, we were all four um, about to be drafted in the Army, and none of us wanted to get in the Army. So one morning, instead of going to physics class, uh, we just suddenly made the decision, the four of us hitchhiked down to San Antonio and joined the Navy mm -hmm. together. And uh, well, what did your parents say about that? Well, they knew it was coming, mm -hmm. and I. I had let it be known far and wide that I did not want to go in the army. I don't know what uh, you know made me think that I didn't know anyone in the army. I just knew I didn't want to get in the army, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd never been at sea before. But in any case, the navy sounded good to me, and and so we did. So what happens after you enlist? Well, we had a month's leave to put our whatever we had to put in order, which wasn't very much. <laughs> And then we got on a troop train in San Antonio and spent the next three nights going out to the uh, Balboa Naval Training Station in the San Diego. Tell me about that train ride. It was, uh, it was about a 15 uh, Pullman coach train, all full of young conscripts, all going to San Diego for basic naval training. It was quite a ride. There were card games from one end to the other of the train, and every time it stopped, the SP shore patrols had to get off and make sure nobody <laughs> ran off. <laughs> it was a riot. Um, you know, the old style Pullman coaches, uh, the two seats uh, on, the, on the floor level face each other. Then there's a pull down berth up above, which is not very wide. But we were told on boarding the, tr on the train that there would be two to the upper berth and two to the lower berth. Well, the guy that was supposed to stay in the upper berth with me, I told him that he wasn't going to sleep very much because I snored very loudly. I don't know if I did or not, but I told him that. And it scared him off, so I had it all by myself. <laughs> and we got to San Diego. But traveling through, those were the days before many of the orange groves in Southern California had been taken over by real estate developers. And we went through there in April when all of the orange trees were in full blossom and uh, I, will, I will never forget the smell of those orange blossoms. I'd never smelled them before, but it was just, it was a heavenly aroma, fragrance, just everywhere. And of course, all the windows in the train were up and everybody was taking in this marvelous scene as well as the, as the wonderful, wonderful scents of the rose blossoms. Does uh, sort of the attitude change when you get to basic? Very quickly. Very quickly, Tell me about you well. You're herded in to uh, to get your shots, uh, to go to the barber shop, in which they take about one minute to completely uh, uh, make you bald, and uh, you get your your clothing, uh, this and that and the other. They ask you your approximate size, and if they don't have it, you take whatever size they give you. Fortunately, I did get shoes that were reasonably comfortable, and then shown to our barracks and assigned to a berth, to a berth, uh, double-deck bunks and lockers. And then the, the CO there of the company, uh, of that photograph, uh, he was our company commander. And um, like the Marine Corps, their first three weeks is to uh, do everything in the world uh, they can 
to uh, make you understand what discipline is. Fortunately, I had been in physical training with the Navy V-12 unit at Southwestern for nearly two years, so I was in really top-notch physical shape. And so the, the marching under full pack and, and all the exercises and all that sort of thing, uh, you know, I thought it was fun. But um, some of the guys that were in there who hadn't been doing it were really found it difficult. You mentioned a picture. Do you want to uh, show that picture? Is that yes. This is the, is the uh, photograph here of the, uh, of the company. Uh, this was made shortly after we... Uh, about two weeks into into basic training, and uh, April 1944. April 1944, late April of 44. And where are you in this um, picture? I'm right here at the very top. I was the tallest man in the unit, and so yeah. they put them in by height. And uh, but the company commander uh, looks. He doesn't look all that gruff, but. You know, he looks very pleasant in the <laughs> picture, but he could be he could be very, very, very persuasive. But he was very good. And his name? Uh, you know, I've forgotten his name. Okay. Yeah. But it was uh it was it was for me it was a great experience. Okay. Halfway through basic training, I came down with mumps for the third time. I'd had them twice as a child, once on one side and a year or two later, once on the other side. So, you know, by all accounts and purposes, I was through with mumps. But halfway through this basic training, I contracted mumps for the third time, then on both sides. And so they put me in Balbo Naval Hospital, and I was flat on my back for a month. And the Navy doctors there issued me very, very stern warnings about staying in bed, that uh, a young man of my size and age was prime for ruining the rest of his life if he, if he dared get up and walk around very much with mumps, like uh, my, my jaws just disappeared. I was really swollen. And uh, I did pretty much as they said, mm -hmm. except on one occasion. Um, I was trying to get, uh, I had to use, you know, they had to do everything at my bed, and I was trying to get a corpsman to come and to bring a bedpan or something, and he never showed up, and I was desperate, so no one was looking, so I crawled out of bed, I'd been in bed about uh, 14 days at the time, and made my way to the head, uh, the bathroom, and the uh, first time I'd been in there, and I remember going in and getting toward the, the urinals were the ones that were about this high and all the way to the floor with water running, constantly so running. Feet up on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. feet up. Well, the top of it. And then the, the water ran down the front and there was a trough at the bottom at floor level. And I remember getting up that far and then that was the last I remembered. I apparently fainted. And uh, when I woke up, I heard, I, I could feel somebody slapping me on the cheek and shaking me, but it felt like my feet were freezing. And when I finally came to and looked up, I had, when I fell, my feet went into the bottom of where this water was constantly in, and so my feet were soaking wet, as, was my, as were my pajamas, and they dragged me out. And, and again, I got uh, one of the sternest lectures that I've ever had by one of the young Navy doctors about you know, about staying in bed and otherwise uh, what would happen if I did, well, I, I did. And, so and they were a little bit more attentive. How long were you in bed? Uh, a month. A month. A month. Mm -hmm. And then uh, much longer in the hospital after uh, that? About five days, and they released me to duty. But by that time, this company had already graduated, had, and uh, I was too far behind. So they put me back to a company that was about where I was when I, got, when I became ill. Uh, it was a company very similar to this. I don't have a picture of that company because this was, these pictures are made the first uh, week or 10 days that you're there. So their picture was already made. And um, uh, so I didn't get in that one. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, I was very disappointed because the three buddies that I had, that had enlisted with me and were in this company uh, went ahead and and uh, they were assigned uh, to an aircraft carrier. Tell me those three buddies' names. Do you remember those? You know, I don't. Um, Do you remember what happened to those guys? 
I do remember what happened to them. I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that, yeah. Uh, but when I heard they had been assigned uh, to an aircraft carrier, I remember being green with envy because had I had my choice of uh, duty, it would have been on an aircraft carrier. And I knew that by the time I finished that I would more than likely end up on a harbor tug someplace and, and sit out the rest of the war, uh, wherever that was. Well, when I finished basic training, because I was a pre-med student at Southwestern and had finished two years at the university there, uh, I was automatically assigned to be a hospital corpsman uh, aboard the ship or wherever. And I was very uh, pleasantly surprised to be assigned also to an aircraft carrier. It was called the USS Coral Sea at the time, but a week later was renamed the USS Anzio uh, CVE-57. One of the, the 57th uh, small attack carrier or jeep carrier that the Kaiser Shipbuilding Corporation had built, called fondly called in the Navy Kaiser Coffins because they had no the, the armor plating or anything like that on them. Uh, we carried two squadrons, a squadron of uh, uh, bombers and two man bombers and a squadron of fighter planes. And, uh, but so the Anzio and the, the buddies from my company, the others, went aboard the USS Bismarck Sea, which was a sister carrier. I think it was CVE-95. And uh, occasionally in the Pacific, we would get uh, liberty aboard uh, you know, uh, on some uh, godforsaken shot up Pacific island and run into each other ashore, where it seemed that uh, there were two choices of drinks, either um, hot Coca-Cola or cold beer. Well, I didn't care for beer at the time at all. I didn't like the taste of it at all. So I was, well, everybody knew that I would be glad to trade, uh, to trade my beer, my cold beer for a hot Coke. So I had a lot of offers usually. And uh, so I would see my, these, these guys there. And we sort of lost track of each other. Well, let's um, talk about um, uh, when you left Ford, when was that? This was in September of 40, 44, yes. We were... We put out to sea uh, to Honolulu. Uh, we had I was assigned to the uh, to the uh, hospital section of the ship. And, and what was what was the day like in the hospital section? Well, initially it was very. I was just learning the. I was the, I was doing two things. They put me in the first aid station, and the chief pharmacist was showing me what this was and that was and how to do simple treatments and use APCs. APC is all-purpose capsule, and that's good for anything from all, all kinds of things. We gave out a lot of those. And uh, the, the other, my other assignment was to work at times with our ship's surgeon as a surgical assistant, which I enjoyed very much. What do you think was in an APC? Probably aspirin. I know there was aspirin in it. Um, Probably a little bit of um, painkiller besides what would normally be an aspirin, but it was for general aches and pains. If somebody had strained or something, you give them a couple of APCs and send them back to duty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, but it was, uh, and then the other duty I discovered when, uh, and our, our surgeon, we had a ship surgeon who was our senior medical officer, then we had an ENT guy, you know, and throat, uh, lieutenant junior grade. Uh, who did that, and then a chief pharmacist, and the rest of us were pharmacist mates or hospital corpsmen. And uh, the, the other duty that when we got into port was that, uh, and our ship surgeon, very strong, stern man, I liked him very much, Dr. Hatch, uh, he let it be known before we ever got to Honolulu that anyone in the ship's, in the hospital, ship's hospital, if any of us went ashore and came back, with any uh, STD, uh, we were out of there. We'd be sh we'd be we'd be demoted to some, one of the deck gangs, and so to I guess partially to emphasize this at the gangway when everybody else was going ashore, uh, in, in turns we stood there with a bucket of condoms and 
gave them out to every sailor that got off the ship and usually found most of them in the ditch at the side of the road. But in any event, uh, we had these um, two or three days after putting him back out to sea, everybody had to line up and come down to sick bay and be thoroughly examined for to see if they had any sign of a, of a, of a, of a venereal disease. And, and the treatment, particularly for that, at that time for syphilis, was, was gosh awful. It was terrible. I don't know how guys ever lived through it, but you know, I guess they were willing to risk it. For well, it was a, it was a, a, a solution. I've forgotten the name of it now, but it's put in a syringe, and it's injected through the through the uh, urethra, and then massaged into the penis by the uh, by the uh, the fella to make sure it's sort of a thick uh, solution, uh, sort of like syrup. I don't know that it did all that much good, but it was the only thing we had. And uh, penicillin was new at that time, and we used that for a lot of things. But uh, most uh, most fellows seemed to, at least so far as I knew, uh, would eventually recover from it, or e either either that or they didn't come back to to see us aboard. But on our cruise from San Diego to Pearl Harbor, we did our first operation, and it was a young um, steward's mate. Uh, steward's mates in the Navy at that time were all young American black men, and he had an emergency appendectomy. Was that your first operation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did it go? Oh, it went well. went well, yeah. I, you know, I hadn't done operated on people or anything, but I'd had enough of biological sciences at the university and dissections of all sorts of things that that just fascinated me to no end, and so I, I loved it. Uh, so we did the surgery, and he was the only one in our sick bay. And uh, he'd been in there perhaps an hour or two, and I was on duty, and there was a knock at the door. Our sick bay would hold 32 men in double-deck bunks. And uh, the bunks were spacious compared to those in the, in the, where the ship's crew stayed. And so uh, uh, I went to the, our swinging door, and there stood a first-class cook who was also an American young black man. And he was the, this young steward's mate was in his group. And he had come to visit him, see how he was on, which I thought was very natural. But... It wasn't so much that that uh, looked so peculiar, uh, because when this fellow came in, uh, he had a large Bible under his arm. Well, I'd, I'd never seen anybody carry a Bible, much less a sailor. It was, you know, it was just, I was just curious as to what had happened. And he didn't stay five minutes, and but I was so curious as to what he was doing and tried to busy myself about the war and I think he opened his his book and perhaps read a, something to him and and I saw him with his head bowed for a moment and he left next day he came back every day that uh, he was in those were the days when if you had an appendectomy uh, you had to stay in bed for 10 days now they get you up in three hours but then it was 10 days and um, at the end of the 10 days uh, uh, he came back, and we had discharged his shipmate. And um, this, by that time, I came to know his name, John Alexander, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He had joined; uh, he had been forced to join as a uh, uh, conscientious objector, and it had been promised that he would not be put aboard a a um, ship of war. But but he was anyway, and there he found himself. He could do, do nothing think about it. So he was a but he was a first class cook. And so he told me about a group that was meeting on the ship, and uh, said they some of them played guitars or mandolins and violins. They just had a great time together, and you know come down sometime. He thought I would enjoy it. Well, I didn't go initially, but eventually I did, and and there were about a dozen or fifteen sailors there mostly white, a few blacks, and some darn good musicians playing uh, real, um, I wouldn't call it jazzy type music, but music that I had never heard before. 
And as I listened to the words, I would every now and then hear a word that was, I got the idea shortly thereafter that it was some sort, had some sort of religious meanings to it. And uh, I began to feel rather uncomfortable. Um, and especially when they said that they were going to um, pray and got down on their knees and obviously were sort of going in turns and I had never done that. And when they got down and all closed their eyes, I got up and sneaked out the door and left and was sort of shivered as I went out because that just wasn't, that just wasn't me. And then uh, I saw John occasionally here and there, and he was always very kind, very gentle, very fine man. And he would ask me to come back every now and then. And, and I, oh, weeks later, I said, well, I'll give it one more try. Went back again. It was pretty much the same sort of thing. But this time, I thought I went back prepared. I was going, I thought I could ask them some very difficult questions and, you know, trip them up. That was my intent. And I soon discovered that when I asked them a question, that uh, most of them were uh, would start thumbing through uh, their book, the New Testament or Bible they had in their hands, and and one of them would put it in my hands and say, and point to something, and say, "Read this, right? Read it out loud." And so I read it out loud, and most of the time it. At least initially, didn't, I didn't see any relationship between what I'd ask and what they were asking me to read until there seemed to be a relationship. But, um, and they were showing me, at least from their perspective, what they deemed the answer to my question was not by what they said, but what they were pointing to in the Bible. Well, I hadn't come there to argue with a book. I wanted to argue with them, but I couldn't draw them into the argument. And so when they got down on their knees and, and, and began their time of prayer, I again got up and left. Well, we made it to Hawaii, had some uh, fabulous shore leaves there. We're headed then toward the Philippines by way of the Marshall Islands, we talk, And um, uh, we were going to offer uh, air support for the invasion of the Philippines. Lady Gulf, uh, the Battle of Lady Gulf was still going on. And we were assigned to anti-sub patrol. And then by December of uh, 44, an event happened which, uh, which um, still makes me shudder to think of it. It had nothing really to do with the Japanese. Uh, but there was a small typhoon, very small, tight typhoon that ended up being called Typhoon Cobra that was one of the worst typhoons to hit in that Pacific area. Uh, I think the last one of that intensity was 1889, and this was 1944, December. It wasn't a large one, but a very strong one. And weather reports apparently that had come in to the, to the part of the fleet that I was in, they got conflicting reports, and weather reports weren't all that good. They didn't have satellites or anything to show where storm clouds were. Admiral Halsey made, uh, at least from the information that I have read since then, uh, made some, um, perhaps some wrong decisions about, we were trying to, we were trying to refuel. This was long before the nuclear age, and so you had to pull alongside fleet oilers to be refueled, and the sea was getting higher and higher and we had, uh, we had five destroyer escorts supporting the carrier to shield it from Japanese subs. And finally the, the seas got to the point where um, it was impossible for the ships to run parallel to each other with these fuel lines going. They were breaking and, and some of the destroyers were uh, down to just a fourth of fuel. And the storm came up so quickly that they had not ballasted their empty uh, fuel tanks with seawater to you know to let the ship ride lower into the troughs of the waves and but they had to break away from fueling. We were all had to wear life jackets. They would I don't know what good they would have done. One of the um, three of the destroyers began rolling so severely in the storm, 70, 80 degrees, 
Uh, one of them uh, lost a stack, one of their smokestacks. Three of them sank, just rolled over and sank. Very few men were saved off of those, off those destroyers. The smaller destroyer escorts, for some reason, seemed to manage better than the larger destroyers. We lost uh, uh, just about every plane that we had on the carrier. Those who were those that were lashed to the flight deck with, with half-inch cables, when the ship would roll hard to starboard or hard to port, like this, uh, the the planes broke their cables and they rolled over the side. Most of the planes were on the hangar deck to give the ship a little, a little uh, less roll at the top. But they were cabled down. Fortunately, they had drained all the gasoline out. But they too broke their cables. Many of them did. And then when the ship would roll hard to port like this, these big torpedo bombers and the fighter planes would, would screech across the floor and our hospital bay was immediately under the hangar deck. So we could hear this god-awful noise of this metal grinding on metal and they'd bang into the bulkhead and you could hear this loud crash of these planes in there crippling their wings and all of this and then the ship would slowly right itself and pitch way back this way and they'd screech across the floor again and another loud bang and uh, the, the bow of the ship and those gigantic waves would, would come clear out of the water and then when it's just, it, would, it would just sort of shudder right there and then bang down like that and the next wave would come almost over the flight deck which was some uh, 45 or 50 feet off the water. You just cannot imagine the, 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 the power of water in those kinds of situations. How long did this last? This was three days. And um, it was on December the 18th, which was the worst day. Uh, our hospital, our, our, our sick bay was running over with men who had been crushed or hit or fell or had something broken or were lacerations. We, in some of our bunks, we had two to a bunk. And there was, uh, it, was it, it looked like a slaughterhouse at times. And in the midst of this absolute bedlam, uh, I could see some of the most vain and profane men I think I'd ever met in my life. You could, I saw several of them holding on to anything they could hold on to because you could hardly stand up, crying out to some unknown God that if he would just save them, that they'd do thus and so. And this sort of a foxhole religion, that was the first thing I thought of. And in the midst of this bedlam in our sick bay, uh, this first class cook, John Alexander, walked in. He had several shipmates in there. And his, he, he looked so calm and collected, I couldn't believe it. And I couldn't understand because everyone else was just about petrified with fear, but not him. And I swore at him. And he came over to me and I let out some string of oaths and said, oh, in the blankety blank blank, can you look so calm, John, when probably this time tomorrow we're all going to be at the bottom of the Pacific out, out here. And, and in a very calm, serene voice, he said, well, he always called me Macklin or Mac. He said, Mac, I don't know. Uh, about you, but God has given me a sense of serenity and calmness and the assurance that he has a ministry or a work of some kind for me in Tulsa, Oklahoma when this war is over. I don't know what it is or where, but I'm convinced that uh, that's, what, that's what he has in store for me. And since he does, even if this ship goes down, I will somehow be physically saved. I don't know how, but I will. Well, it was the most audacious statement I thought I had ever heard in my life. I was just, I was just stunned with what he said. But I remember very vividly in the next probably 12 to 18 hours before we got out of that, I tried to know where John Alexander was on that ship, thinking that if it did go down, and what he told me was indeed true. If his God had given him that kind of an assurance, 
Maybe I could grab his leg and he'd pull me out with him and we'd both be saved. Well, fortunately, the ship managed to survive. And, but we were, we were a pitiful wreck and had to come back to this for overhaul. And on the way back, uh, we were passing by the island of Guam and the sea, in contrast to what we had been in, was as still as this table. It was just glassy smooth, big full moon. I was off duty, sitting on the fantail of the ship, which is um, which is this part of the ship here. This is the fantail, the the uh, the uh, rear of the ship. We had one five-inch gun back there, and it was a favorite place for sailors to sit when they were off duty, especially at sea. And uh, I was sitting back there by myself, thinking about all that had happened and just couldn't believe the, the contrast between what the sea had been, these monstrous waves, which had just about sunk us, and now the sea was just like a piece of glass and was just having sort of difficulty putting it all together. And, and who should be off duty and just happened on this big ship, walk by and see me sitting out there except John Alexander. So he came out and sat down with me. We began to talk and about what we'd seen. And we talked about all those, a number of those men we had seen who had made all sorts of uh, promises to some unknown God about this and that and the other. And, he asked me if I had observed anything since. And I said, well, it looks like they forgot it all pretty quick. Sort of rash promises. And knowing that we were going in for an overhaul and going back out, I, he, I, I, I was so curious as to how he could be so calm. I just could not understand it. And, of course, I think that's what he was waiting for me to, to ask. He was a very gentle, kind, soft-spoken individual. And um, he said, well, it's an assurance that comes from having faith in the one whom I believe is the Lord and Savior of the world, uh, Jesus Christ. And when you have that kind of assurance, uh, no matter what happens, no matter what uh, happens in life one way or another, uh, God is with you. His Spirit supports you, and you can face all sorts of things which would otherwise be uh, very frightening and very uh, terrifying. Well, I knew that whatever it was, that he certainly had that kind of spirit. And I desperately needed it because I knew we were going to go out and face more of that sort of thing. So I asked him then how, you know, what... What did you do to, to, to obtain that? He said, well, you don't obtain it. It's a gift. There's nothing you can do. You don't buy it or anything. It's a gift of God. And uh, he said, you know, he said, I think, I think you're looking for it, H.T. And he said, Let me, let's, let's pray together. And I said, John, I've, I've never prayed. I don't know how to do that sort of thing. He said, well, let me pray for you then. And and I will say, I will uh, just say a prayer that, in which I think God might put into your heart. So just the two of us sitting there, he started to pray in a very soft voice. And, and in a few moments, it seemed that the words that he, was, that he was saying began to strongly resonate in my own heart and mind. And it almost seemed as if I was saying them, though indeed he was saying them. And after a few more moments, I found myself saying these words to my own astonishment. And it was a, it was a, a, a very particular very life-changing moment in my life. It, it was something that I, I, I still find it hard to describe, but I know it changed my life profoundly because in the next few days 
I began to discover in a very profound way that the things that I didn't like, you know, to read the Bible or to pray like those guys did, that was as far from me as the East it was from the West. And now I suddenly found myself wanting to know more about it, wanting to know, to, to, to read something in the Bible that was meaningful. And some of these verses that these guys had shown me, which had, had been utterly meaningless to me before, had with these sort of new eyes that I was looking at it with, uh, became very meaningful. It began to make sense. And I was, I would, I would just sit in utter amazement at what I was looking at now, which I'd looked at before and seemed meaningless, or just hodgepodge, and now looking at it with, uh, with, with a different mentality, a different set of eyes, so to speak. It was taking on meaning that just, it just floored me, absolutely floored me. So I began going to these, as it turned out, these, all of these sailors were part of a group called the Navigators. Well, the Navigators was an organization founded by Navy men, and it was initially a ministry for Navy personnel for uh, Christians and for them to study together and to support each other in their prayer life and so forth. And uh, John gave me a little card, a little pocket thing called B-rations. All they were were what we business-sized cards. And on one side there would be a scripture verse, some meaningful scripture verse written out on one side, and on the other side would be the reference, either in the Old or New Testament. And so I, it was suggested that I should start to memorize these because this was, from their perspective, the Word of God. And if I wished to grow strong and to be able to, to uh, uh, understand it, then I should, as the Scripture says, to hide His Word in your heart. And so I began a series of memorization of these. It ended up being hundreds and hundreds of them. And I remember most of them to this day, and I remember times, many times in my life since then, when at this incident or that incident, this verse or that verse, which I'd memorized in the Navy, has just uh, undergirded me and helped me in so many ways that it's been utterly astonishing. Then we got to Iwo Jima, and I was relishing in this newfound life and. I felt like I was growing by leaps and bounds in my understanding. Well, the suicide, the kamikazes began to fall on us at the end of the Philippine invasion, a new thing. And at Iwo Jima, they came out in huge force. There were uh, about 13 or 14 carriers there. About Tell me when this is. This, uh, the, the battle for Iwo Jima began in February of 1945. and. Um, uh, we were to support the, uh, the, the ground war there with uh, air sorties, with bombing and strafing and all that sort of thing. And we were there to, uh, initially the planes went in to drop tons and tons and tons of bombs to silence the big Japanese guns on Mount Suribachi and the island. And when those um, uh, began to be destroyed, uh, then our ships could go in a little bit closer, and I could we could see the island, in, you know, in the distance. And when our planes were off, uh, I was in the hospital division at the time. We just sat around and waited until they came back to see if they were all going to come back, or many had been wounded or killed or whatever. Take care of them. We had uh, we had bought as a ship's crew on the previous uh, tour back to the States, an ice cream maker, and put in our, put in our kitchen our, 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 for one of our cooks there. In fact, I talked with him the other day. He lives in, 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 uh, in Dallas, Texas. And uh, the only way you could buy ice cream, and the only flavor, you could get any flavor you wanted as long as it was chocolate. And the only way you could buy it was by a gallon 
and they used all the gallon cans for peaches and fruits and beans and stuff like that. They kept all these cans and washed them out and filled them up with ice cream. And it was 50 cents a gallon. And so while uh, one day uh, the three of us pitched in, we bought a gallon of ice cream, went up on the deck, sat out under the wing of one of the uh, torpedo bombers and while the planes were off, most of them, and with these big, powerful Navy binoculars set there, watching those poor old Marines over there on Iwo Jima being shot at and killed and living under horrible conditions, while there we were, a few miles offshore, sitting in relative calm with a big tablespoon, you know, just chogging in the chocolate ice cream. It, it was just, it was such a sharp contrast. No, oh, I was so glad I wasn't in the Army or the Marines at that time. <laughs> but during that terrible battle, the kamikazes came in in huge, huge wings. And one of the carriers that was hit, I was, my duty was topside, uh, was the Bismarck Sea. And that was the carrier that some of my friends went aboard. Three of them were in the hospital division. Uh, it happened after, just after dark. Two suicide planes hit it. One of them, apparently carrying an armor-piercing bomb, hit it in the fantail. This would be this part of the ship in the back and went down through a couple of decks, exploded in its after magazine where their ammunitions are stored, and there was this monstrous explosion. It, I, you, it all, you could feel the, the shock wave of it from where I was on the deck. And, and the whole after end of the flight deck, it looked as if it was on, you couldn't see it in the dark except that it was illuminated by the explosion. It seemed to rise up as if it was on hinges from the power of the explosion and then collapsed on the ship. And it sank in about uh, 14 or 15 minutes. And there were hundreds and hundreds who were killed in the initial explosions. And this was in February of 1945. And those who survived the North Pacific in February is not a warm place. And uh, I don't know how many perished in the sea because of the hypothermia and that sort of thing. But the, the three um, and how I got assigned to the Anzio and because our company was split and the others went to the Bismarck Sea. And as I watched the Bismarck Sea go down, I felt as strongly as I've ever felt anything in my entire life that somehow or other, for reasons which I didn't understand, still don't understand, that I had been, uh, that I had been saved, as it were, for a purpose. And I made my commitment, my covenant with God, as it were, at that time, that whatever it was, wherever it took me uh, to fulfill what I believed his purpose for my life was, I fully intended to do that. And... Uh, we got through Iwo Jima, we went to Okinawa where the kamikazes were even thicker. We saw, I uh, got a, a liberty on one of those little uh, islands in the Okinawa chain in which the bodies of Japanese prisoners were just uh, stacked like cordwood. Uh, we had to put out to sea several times because of the intensity of the, of the kamikaze raids but eventually got through that and then we were 300, about 380 miles off the coast of Japan as, and were preparing for the invasion of Japan when the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, the captain made the announcement. That the war had captain called the whole crew 
to the flight deck. And I wonder to this day that a dozen or more didn't fall off. <laughs> the celebrations were such. This plane that you see here on the flight deck is a Japanese Emily. Every Japanese plane had a, some sort of a designation. This was a Japanese Emily that had been captured intact and we were ferrying it back to the States for our Air Force, I presume, to take apart and look at and that sort of thing. So all of our planes had been taken off by this time. And um, uh, we took this uh, back, to the, back to the East Coast. Um, but after that tumultuous celebration that the war was over, we were attacked two days later by uh, suicide planes that apparently either hadn't gotten the word or they were still intent to sink us if they could. We survived that and then uh, headed back uh, to the States uh, uh, from Okinawa. We had this long called homeward bound pennant which must have been, I don't know how long it was, but it streamed from the mast way back toward the aft of the ship and when we were When we were going back, <clears throat> it was such a such a, 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 a joyful time that uh, we couldn't believe the war was over and the homeward bound pennant was raised and all the, the uh, Navy warships that were in the harbor at Okinawa, when they saw the uh, homeward bound pennant, you know, they all raised their flags of uh, congratulations and all that sort of thing. So we went back and we had all the planes flew off and we had um, welded to our hangar deck then about 1,200 uh, two or three decker bunks because we were going back uh, to the Pacific to ferry uh, soldiers back to the States. So we, we made one trip, I believe it was to Honolulu and picked up a load and took them back. Then we went to Okinawa. But no, then we went to, we were the first warship to go to, um, and here this tells it right here, Baby Flat Top makes port to return troops to U.S. Uh, this was in, the, we were the first American warship in the harbor of Shanghai, China. And we, we uh, uh, pulled up right alongside the, onto a wharf uh, of brownstone, huge brownstone buildings that the British had built there years before. And we got several liberties ashore. This was the Shanghai Herald of December the 2nd, 1945. And we took aboard uh, the soldiers there from the China-Burma-India China Theater of War and uh, got to Okinawa and another typhoon blew up. And so we had to pull out. We'd no sooner dropped anchor until we had to pull anchor and leave the harbor again with the uh, cruiser St. Louis, I believe it was, and several other warships and to ride this one out at sea. Well, that one wasn't nearly as fierce as the previous December typhoon. But if you'd never been in one, you, you must have thought it was horrible. Well, <laughs> they had welded to the hangar decks since most of the soldiers seemed to smoke. They had emptied 500 pound bomb casings that they were about this big around and with the fins, they welded the fins of the deck and with the, with the uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the, the shot itself taken off, they were filled with sand, or almost with sand, to use as ashtrays. So they were scattered all around the hangar deck. Well, when we got into this typhoon, we had 1,200 of the sickest soldiers <laughs> you have ever seen in your life. And they used the, these, these 
things for their cigarette butts uh, to throw up in. And so they were all, all just about running over. And, but we insisted that they be the ones to dip them out because they were welded to the hangar deck. But we finally did get them back to the States. And uh, our crew had been, our Navy crew had been reduced to half uh, in order to facilitate ferrying them back. Uh, we put into Seattle, Washington, spent a, about three weeks there. Had a wonderful time at the Navigator headquarters, which was in Seattle, Washington at the time. Very uh, rich experience. Then went down to Frisco, another similar experience there. And then we were ordered to Norfolk, Virginia for decommissioning. And uh, we picked up this, this Betty, or this Emily, uh, Japanese aircraft, to take it back to the west east coast. And so we had a leisurely voyage through the, through the uh, um, Panama Canal and up the East Coast and when we got there I got a leave home and went home for a few days and uh, uh, back and then we started decommissioning the ship and uh, finally got my went through about a half a dozen re-enlistment lectures trying to get you to join the Navy Reserve and all this sort of thing but it just went in one ear and out the other I couldn't wait to get out and uh, so we, uh, I was sent to Norman, Oklahoma from there, and I think I'd been in the Navy two years and 18 or 19 days. And we got a very, several very serious re-enlistment lectures at Norman. Uh, all we would have this advantage and that advantage, but nothing of it. I wanted to go back to school, and I had enough, uh, I had enough uh, uh, points uh, for discharge and a GI Bill to see me through the rest of uh, my university experience. And... Uh, so, um, you said that uh, after uh, decommissioning, mm -hmm. or when you first got back, you had some leave home. Yes, we had some leave home. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. tell me about... Well... That. I mean, and what it was like coming back. Well, it was... Um, uh, I, as I, I think I said earlier, I was an only child. And uh, in fact, when we came back to the States from this ferrying service, we stopped in San Francisco. We had six days of leave, but it was, there was not enough time to go to Texas and back. So my mother came out to San Francisco, and I got her a very nice accommodation, the Navy Mothers Club there in Frisco. And, and we, had some, we had some great dinners together. This is, this is my mom when she was visiting us there and uh, a buddy of mine who was uh, who was a yeoman third class and we had dinner at uh, the at one of the big hotels there in San Francisco are you on the right or the left now? uh I this is me on the, on the on this side right here uh-huh yeah and then while you're showing it um the other picture in the upper corner oh this is that? this is in Honolulu uh we had just uh gone ashore with a couple of Navy buddies there and we each had a picture made like that to send to I think I sent this to my to my mother or somebody at home and and got it back a short time you know some years back. Do you know the names of the buddies in the picture? Um, I'm seeing if I've got their names down here you know I don't right now. That's all right and the picture um, I know this is this is Paul Swander here he was he was a very dear friend mm -hmm. he lived in he st still does, so far as I know, in Terre Haute, Indiana. But uh, he and I ran around a lot together. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I look at this picture now, my eyes are almost drawn instantly to my mother, who I guess when you're growing up with a very, very handsome, beautiful woman as she was, as her son, you don't notice that. You know, she's just your mom. But now, as I look at her in these pictures, I thought, God, what a wonderfully beautiful. And she was very, very striking. She had naturally beautiful, auburn, natural auburn hair and always dressed very well. She was, uh, worked as a hostess for many years at the Big Texas Hotel in Fort Worth. And uh, so was, you know, she always had to look nice, and she did. But uh, we had a wonderful visit there. Did your mom correspond with you? Oh yes, um, one of the one of the one of the things that the ship's mail clerk said, well, you know, we didn't get mail only periodically, 
But uh, there were times, and it's, I've got it recorded here in this Fuller diary, um, that uh, there was one time when I got 186 letters in six boxes. And by the time we got off the ship, the fellow that had been the, in charge of the mail there, he said, of all the officers and men on the ship, nobody got more mail or more boxes of stuff than you did, Macklin. And I had uh, all sorts of people at home because our community was rather tight-knit and our high school class was small, so everybody knew everybody. And uh, it looked like everybody on Diamond Hill wrote to me all the time. And, and uh, I always had a box of something. They sent so much stuff that I could hardly give it away. Well, what types of things? Oh, cakes and candy and, and uh, popcorn and, you know, the usual what we call in the Navy pogey bait <laughs> to eat and, and uh, share with each other. Sometimes the... Cakes, you know, just be all falling apart, but that we just reach in, grab it with our hands, and uh, but it was, uh, it was they had we had uh, I never lacked for, for mail. I still have some of those old letters at uh, you know in a box at home. Uh, what kind of a correspondent were you? Did you answer all? The yes, questions? I did. I was a very faithful correspondent. I wrote a lot, still write a lot. And uh, maybe that was the reason I got so much in return. <laughs> but it was uh, it was it was a great, wonderful experience to to do that. Um, so we uh, went to Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, another shipmate on board the Anzio, who was in this uh, this this uh, Bible study class, a guy named Jim Chastain from South Carolina, uh, who was a slightly older man than I and much more mature in his faith. So he wanted to know where I was going back to school and I told him I thought I was going to SMU in Dallas and and he said he thought that uh, if I was open to it that uh, that I ought to go to um, you know I, he, he suggested that I go to a Bible school with him for a year. He was going full time but he said you know it'd, it'd do you a lot of good and you'd help you to get your feet on the ground and so forth and so I decided that I would go with him and it was there in Cleveland Tennessee where across the dining room table I met the girl who was to be my wife <laughs> and her name is Alice Marie And we were married 56 years Saturday. And I knew while I was in the, you know, before I got out of the Navy, that, that I was going to be married. Uh, to my knowledge, I had never met what I thought then was a Christian girl. I mean, a fully committed Christian girl. And I wondered where on earth they were. Where would you, where would you find one? And... Uh, this little school that we went to, every three weeks uh, they post new dining room uh, tables sitting, five boys, five girls to, to a table. And you sit with that same table for three weeks and a new list goes up and they mix everybody up and you sit it, which was a great way to meet by the end of the school year. You'd met all kinds of people, including faculty. Tell us the name of the school. It was called Bob Jones at the time. I'd never heard of it myself. Cleveland, in Cleveland, Tennessee then. It was its last year in Cleveland, Tennessee, now in Greenville, South Carolina. But I'd never heard of it. But he, Jim Chastain was going there and it was good enough for him because I only went to stay a year anyway. So they let me take what I wanted to. And there was a custom there at the time if you wanted to, if you wanted to take a girl to a concert or something and their, their music faculty there was really first class. They had all sorts of operas and musicals and so that you, you wrote a note to the girl that you rented and you sent it over to her dorm. And so we just changed tables and, and there was a little girl called Jackie, somebody, and she sort of caught my eye and I thought I would ask her. So I wrote her this little note and I was somewhat of a cartoonist and I drew a funny figure on it. And was gonna give it to her at dinner that night. But she did or so, it said something that put me off and I went back to the dorm with it in my pocket. And, my roommate, Reese Johnson, 
who had been there two years. He asked me, oh, did you give it? Did you give it to Jackie? And I said, no, I, I forgot my why. I said, who, who else could I give it? He said, well, who else is sitting at your table? Well, we'd just been introduced. And I couldn't think of any of the other girls. And I said, there was an Alice somebody there. He said, Alice. I said, what's your last name? I don't know. It sort of sounded Scandinavian or Swedish or something. Other. And he, brought, he said, oh, would it be Alice Nystrom? I said, yeah, it sounds like it. So he got out his yearbook and thumb through. Yeah, that's Alice. That's Alice. He said, well, give it to her. She's a nice girl. And besides, she's really smart. Okay, I got this out. I erased Jackie and wrote Alice on it and sent it over to the dorm. And by the end of our first date, I knew that girl was going to be my wife. And I asked her on our second, and she said yes on the third. Just like that. That's wonderful. You have a picture of your family? <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And this is what resulted. <laughs> right here. This is Alice right here. But this was the occasion of our 55th wedding anniversary. Where are you? Well, we were wanted to go someplace where no one had to cook or wash dishes, so we went on a Caribbean cruise together. I got, uh, I think we had eight or nine cabins just side by side down one side of the ship, and everybody brought their tux or their formal dress or whatever, and we just had a ball, had an absolute ball. How long was the cruise? It was a week. Mm -hmm. So we had, uh, we had... Uh, well, and show us, is that um, uh, your children? And yes, is our children. children. I have four children. Uh, what are their names? Their names are, are Susan, Catherine, Greg, and Ruth. And then we have six grandchildren and two great-grandchildren here and their spouses and, and so forth. And uh, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful family. What a nice uh, uh, we, uh, So when, we, when Alice and I were married the next year, uh, I was still feeling, as was she, very intently that, you know, what are we going to do with the rest of our life? So, but we were both, her parents had been killed when she was 12 in an auto accident. And she was struggling through school herself with just enough of a small inheritance to see her through the rest of her college. And so we, we went to SMU together. We were entering our junior year. And we lived off campus in a little, uh, little one room, not quite the size of this room and took our meals in the school, the university, dorm, university dining hall. Well, our landlady, the first uh, week that we were there, said that uh, they, were going, they went to a church in, in, uh, in Dallas in a neighborhood called Schofield Memorial Church, and she invited us to go with them. And We didn't know any other place to go. We'd never lived there, so we went. And um, um, it was very interesting, and they announced that they were having a they had an annual missionary conference there every March, and uh, they began preparing for this in November, and the more we heard about it, the more it interested us. It started on a Sunday, concluded on the following Sunday, so it was an eight-day conference. They were having people from about eight or nine different countries from around the world to come in and to speak and to share and, and all this, that, and the other. And a, a missionary from um, the South Sea Islands in the Pacific, from Australia, was among them. And he was assigned to the young uh, married couples class. And we were in that class. And uh, spoke with the first Aussie accent that we had heard. And uh, he challenged us in a way that I had never heard before. I hadn't heard very much, but he challenged us in a way that uh, made us begin to think about what we really wanted to do with the rest of our lives. And, and he uh, used uh, several times a couple of verses of Scripture from the book of Acts, uh, which describes there the... the um, the vision that the Apostle Paul had when he was called, as it were, by God. And Paul heard this voice, 
which is recorded as saying, but get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you my servant. You are to tell others what you have seen of me today and what I will show you in the future. You are to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light so that they may have their, uh, they may have their faith fulfilled and be amongst God's chosen people. Well, for us, it sounded as if it impressed us as being something that, that we needed to commit our lives to. We didn't know where or when, but we did that week. And then uh, shortly thereafter, we were in our little one-bedroomer, and we got to talking about it one night and, and uh, discovered that we both thought that we should work overseas somewhere and uh, I asked Alice, did she have a place in mind? And she said yes. And she asked me, and I said yes. Well, where, where do you think? No, where do you think? So I finally, I, we just took a piece of paper, and I said, let's each write down what we think. And we both wrote just one word, Africa, and we spent 20 years there. Ten years in the Congo and ten years in Kenya. And uh, we went with two little girls who were three and one and a half. Our son was born in the Congo. Our daughter, was, youngest daughter, was born on our first furlough, on our, on our, yes, our first leave, home leave, from Africa in '57. We went to Africa when there were only three independent nations. We left when there were 42, living in two of those nations when they achieved their independence: the Congo and Kenya and um, had a, uh, our children grew up there, our two older daughters finished secondary school there, and uh, it was a, a wonderful experience that uh, all of us look back upon with uh, great pleasure and uh, still have many friends scattered across Africa. I taught radio script writing and program production for sound broadcasting, and over a period of time, uh, the national broadcasting corporations of many countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, began to take these students and make them uh, assistant directors or something like that. Some of them rose to become directors of broadcasting in their own native countries. And uh, so it was a very rich, rewarding, fulfilling life. We came back to the States, uh, continued in that area. I retired in 93 as the uh, CEO of a, an organization simply called the Mission Society, which we formed in 84. Uh, we now have 100, about 160 people scattered in 25 or 26 countries around the world uh, who continue in uh, areas of medicine. And uh, we have a, uh, established a, a, a fully-fledged hospital in Ghana we have four or five mobile medical units in different countries around the world. Uh, do a lot of literacy work, uh, a lot of teaching, especially English as a second language. Our largest field is Kazakhstan in northeastern Russia. So it's been a very rich, rewarding, and fulfilling life. And uh, I think it really all began when I got the mumps and was missed my billet on whatever ship I would have been on. Instead, got put on the Coral Sea. Yes. Um, Mr. Alexander, was it? John, John Alexander, Alexander, right. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, do you know what happened? Oh, yes, we're still in touch with each other, uh -huh. yes. He did went He, 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 he went back to Tulsa. Uh -huh. God did have a ministry for him. He and his father and a younger brother uh, were invited to begin a prison ministry there, and for probably 30 or 40 years, uh, they had a tremendous... Uh, ministry in the prison system of the greater Tulsa area of Oklahoma. Uh, he took his, uh, he became a, uh, he was a work for the U.S. Post Office. Uh, when he retired from that, he got his real estate license. He became a real estate broker, and he's retired from that now. His, uh, his, uh, his uh, lovely wife, Marie, died a few years ago. His daughter is the uh, leading lawyer in Tulsa and his son, professor of medicine at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. So we, so we still talk together every now and then. That's 
Texas to the Pacific to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, you are now in Atlanta. How did you end up in Atlanta? Well, we came back to the States in 70, in, in 71 because we had two daughters back here in university. We had two more children in high school. My wife and I are both only children. There are no aunts, uncles, cousins. And we being seven or 8,000 miles away and they're back here in school, it was becoming untenable. And um, if you've never grown up in this country, as our daughters had not, and we didn't realize how traumatic 1968 was here. That was the year our first daughter graduated from high school. She went, they went to the Rift Valley Academy in Kenya where Teddy Roosevelt laid its cornerstone in 1909, right after he left the presidency. So we just determined we had to come back and make a home for them until we got them all through school and uh, go back to Africa then if, if we could. And um, there was an opportunity here in Atlanta to become the uh, director of the Protestant Hour radio program, uh, which was the longest running uh, single radio, religious radio program in, in, in the United States at the time for the Methodist series. So I did that for a couple of years and then went back to our board of missions again for 10 years as a field representative and then formed the Mission Society and concluded that in 92 so far as my active role, though I still you know, help out as needed here and there. Mm -hmm. um, in the last minute, mm -hmm. do you, is there anything that you want to sum up, any feelings, anything that um, you just want to sort of close with? Well, if I had it all to do over again, uh, you know, when, whenever any of us say that, there are always a few crooks and turns here and there that if we could smooth off the edges, we would. But by and large, I would run back over the same path. Uh, even, even Typhoon Cobra, knowing what I know about it now, it was a, um, it served as a turning point for my entire life. And it led me in a direction that I would never have imagined and I cannot but, uh, but thank God for uh, those uh, rich and valuable experiences which have meant so much in our lives and have become part and parcel of who my wife and I are, our children and their children and their children. So for all of that, we're truly grateful. Well, Mr. Macklin, I want to thank you for your story. It has been a wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you. It's been my, it's been my pleasure, believe me. Thank you.